focusing, and of course, the, uh, we call in this the judgment at Megiddo. It's John, uh, it's Revelation 14, 14 through 15, 8, and we're going to see, and the focus in this is really the rise of the Antichrist. We've been seeing that, and the judgment of God. And so we've been seeing in chapter 14 and now chapter 15 some things. Let me break it down for you. Chapter, four, uh, chapter 12, we saw the overview of the tribulation. That's like the second or third time in the book of Revelation he does that. Chapter 6 gave an entire overview, and so we saw that. Chapter 13 is the Antichrist, the false prophet. And now, chapters 14 and 15, and we got most of 14 last week, we're seeing Jesus Christ and the coming judgment. Sometimes when we say the word judgment, people don't like it. They don't want to think about it that way, but that's what it is. Well, most of you know, we sang the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I love it. Well, I, the, the very special songs today, Song of the Lamb and, and, and all those things. When we think about Great is Thy Faithfulness, uh, I remember reading that in, in this Ecclesia, uh, uh, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, compassions never fail, they're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And so you look at that and you go, that's wonderful. But when you look at it, you realize this is in the book of Lamentations and it's right in the middle that God judging the nation of Israel and removing them from the land. And so the Bible teaches us that God is not only faithful to love us and to save us, but he's also faithful to discipline us. And so when we look at that, God is faithful not only to save us and deliver us, but also to judge. And in the book of Revelation, we are seeing God's judgment. We see as we get into chapter 14 and 15, we're going to see that he is faithful to judge. Now, that's a hard thing, and the whole book is hard. And I mentioned this in the first service, but let's just understand this, y'all. Jesus Christ could come at any second. When he comes, he's going to take us off the face of the earth. All of us who have believed in Jesus Christ for eternal life, we're going to be gone. There are going to be a whole bunch of people left on this earth that have never understood or that don't, don't understand, are they going to go right through this tribulation? It is our responsibility in the time that we have left to tell as many people as possible about Jesus Christ so they can believe in him for eternal life and not be left on this earth. And because there's a lot of judgment. Let me show you what's going on. Then we're going to see this is called, there's, there's a judgment. This is called the harvest at the end of the tribulation. Matthew 24 and 25 calls this the separation of the sheep and the goats. Matthew chapter 3 calls it the harvest of the winning fork. Revelation 14 is the harvest and the sickle is going to come and crush the grapes and when he crushes the grapes we're going to see this great judgment so we've been seeing these things and in the book of Revelation there are the seven seal judgments we already saw those that was in one chapter then there was the seven trumpet judgments which deals with the final three and a half years we're going to see we haven't seen them yet we're going to see them beginning in chapter 15 the seven bowl judgments but there's something that we really talked about and just mentioned last week there are seven angels listed in Revelation chapter 14. These are not the same seven angels who have the golden bowls of wrath. We're going to talk about it. I'll show you how. Here's the outline for our passage. It's the judgment. Here comes the angels ripe for judgment. Here's the preparation for the bowl judgments, the seven angels. We're going to talk about that. They're coming with the, the bowls and the judgment's going to come on the earth. So there's a, a lot of things there. When we started, if you, if you flip back to, chapter, to Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, this is what we saw at the beginning. That John says, I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, that's where Jerusalem is built, and with him 144,000 having his name and the names of his father, and the name of his father written on their foreheads. Now, we saw that. That's the Lamb, Jesus Christ, standing on Mount Zion with 144,000. You remember the 144,000 were 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. God raised them up. They believed in Jesus Christ for eternal life. And they are going to the nation of Israel and proclaiming the truth. And many, many, many Jewish people will believe in Jesus Christ during the tribulation. They're going to believe in him, and the nation of Israel is going to turn to God and call upon the name of the Lord. That's the 144,000. We also saw in that passage that there's some angels there, and, and they talked about Babylon falling, and we'll talk more about that because that's going to have details in chapter 16, 17, and 18, that part as well. Now, as we get to this, there are seven angels found in Revelation 14. They are not the same seven angels that blew the trumpets. They're not going to be the same seven angels that will have the golden bowls. We're going to see who they are. And what I did, I decided to, to give you the seven angels that are found in Revelation 14. Look at verse 6. 
He starts off and says, I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven having the eternal gospel. So that was the first one. Then in verse 8, I saw another angel, a second one, talking about Babylon is fallen. Then in verse 9, another angel, another angel, the third one following, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast. We saw that. Then verse 14, this is where we're going to start this morning. This is a fourth angel. And he said, I looked and behold, a white cloud sitting on that cloud was like a son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sickle. That's actually an angel. We'll talk more about it. Then the next verse, verse 15, is another angel. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice, put the sickle in. Then there's another angel giving, uh, in verse, uh, you know, 15, then on down to 17, another angel came out of the temple. And then all the way down to verse 18, another angel. So we find that there are seven angels doing this judging. And it's judging with a sickle. Now, you may understand this, that in that day and time, they had these grapevines, everything growing up. They would come with a sickle, cut the grapevines down, pile them together, put them in the wine press, and squeeze it out, and the grape juice would come out. This is symbolic of God taking the unbelieving world, bringing them together, cutting them down, and then destroying them. That's what he's going to do. He's going to judge the world when he comes as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And these are the unbelievers. And so as we start, look at verse 14 of chapter 14 and see what we see. Here's John and he's continuing to look and it says, Then I looked and behold a white cloud. And sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, John has seen the beast, the false prophet, and the lamb, and now he sees someone sitting on a cloud. And he says, I saw him with a white cloud. Most people think this is the, the glory of God. We're going to see it later on. That the, the, the Bible talked about something called the Shekinah, Shekinah glory, which is a kind of a manifestation of God in a sense. And so he sees this angel and it says, Son of Man. And by the way, Son of Man is a title for Jesus. And sometimes, if you look at it, you may say, oh, is this Jesus sitting there? But as you look in the flow of the passage, these are angels. They're taking orders from each other. This, what, this angel is going to come out, and another angel is going to tell this angel what to do. Let me tell you something. Angels don't tell Jesus what to do. Jesus tells angels what to do, okay? So these are all angels. They're going to be telling each other what they're supposed to do and those kind of things. And this is the fourth angel. This is the flow. The first angel gave the eternal gospel. The second talked about the fall of Babylon. The third one talked about the judgment about the beast. Here's the fourth one in verse 14. He's coming with a sickle. He's coming to judge. He's coming to cut down. And so when we follow that, we go to verse 15. We saw the fifth angel. Here it is. Look what he says. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. And this is one angel telling another angel what to do. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth, of the earth is ripe. So he says, here he goes. And we saw this, this angel came out of the temple. Now, you remember, I've told you this, and we're going to see it more later on in the passage. In heaven, just like on the earth, when the Jewish people were on the earth and they had a temple, and at the temple, it was called really a tabernacle. And they had an altar. And they had an Ark of the Covenant. They had all that. All of that on this earth was a copy of the one that is in the heavens. And John is seeing in the heavens, and he sees the temple. He's going to see later on the Ark of the Covenant. He's going to see all that. So here's this angel. Another angel came out of the temple. There is a temple in heaven. And he's crying out with a loud voice to the one who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle. And reap, cut it down, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth, earth is ripe. So it's time to judge. The harvest is ripe. And by the way, when you hear something say it's ripe, you think, oh, this is good. This word doesn't mean good. The word ripe here means dried. It means withered. It means bad. The harvest is bad. The crop is bad. It's time to deal with it. God is going to judge the fallen world. As you know, in the tribulation, there are going to be many people who believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life. There are going to be many people who reject Jesus Christ and take the mark of the beast and go just the opposite. And when the judgments come, they blaspheme God. They're opposed to God. When Jesus comes, and this passage is going to say, say Jesus is coming. And by the way, when we looked at the seven seal judgments, it ends with Jesus coming. When we saw the seven trumpet judgments, it ends with Jesus coming. When we see these seven angels, it's going to end with Jesus coming. When we see the seven bold judgments, it's going to end with Jesus coming. They all come together at the end. God is telling us all these different ways how it's going to end. And this is what he's doing. So it's really, really powerful. The harvest is ripe. 
which means it's ready, it's bad. God has done that throughout history. Have you thought about it? At the time of Noah, the world got so bad and so wicked. What did God say? God said, the, the wickedness of the world has come upon me. I, I, I actually regret that I've done this. And so he picked Noah and his wife and three sons and three wives and put them on the ark and saved, the rest of the, saved them from the rest. And then Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he came and sent an angel in there to look and see is Sodom and Gomorrah as bad as he thought it was. And he was and he judged them. And then the land of Canaan. There were seven tribes of the Amorites living in the land. And the, as God says, the iniquity of the Amorites was horrible. They were horrible people. God used the Jewish people to come in to take over the land. Now, this is the end time. It's time for judgment. God will judge. You understand that, and just quickly, we're going to be raptured out. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation. We've been looking at it. That's the book of Revelation. But at the end of that tribulation... Jesus Christ is coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords to judge this world and to set up his kingdom. All of us who are with Jesus Christ, who have believed in him, will be taken off the face of the earth. And when he comes back to set up the kingdom, we will be coming back with him to be in the kingdom with him. He is coming back in these passages to judge the fallen world when he comes to set up his kingdom. So we're going to see that. So watch. So that, that angel, one angel came out there and he's got the sickle. Other angel says, come to reap. So verse 16 says, then he who sat on the cloud, this is that angel, swung the sickle over the earth and the earth was reaped. He's, that's judgment. Now, I want to show you something because this, this passage of Jesus coming to judge is actually taught by Jesus. So I want you to hold your place right there, and I want you to flip over to Matthew chapter 24. Just flip over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. And I'm going to put this up right here. This is Matthew 24 and 25. We're going to see it real quickly. I'm going to go real fast, but I just want you to see this. This is when Jesus comes to judge at the end of the, of the, of the tribulation. Look at verse 29 of chapter 24. But immediately after the tribulation, meaning at the very end of the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the powers of heaven will be shaken, and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky when all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why are they going to mourn? Because he's coming to judge. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power. Now watch what's going to happen. He will send forth his, they'll notice who's coming, angels with great trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Now look over at verse 31 of chapter 25. Look what he says. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, that's his him coming, and all, who's going to come with him? And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and watch what he's going to do. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. This is separating the believers from the unbelievers. Look at verse 33. He will put the sheep on the right, goats on the left. Notice verse 34. The king will say to those on the right, Come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you from the foundation of the world. These are the people who are believers when Jesus comes. But look a little bit down to verse 41. He will say to those on his left, that's the goats, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. And then the very end, verse 46, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so he's going to come and it's going to be a judgment to the world. And there'll be people who are believers who will get to go into the kingdom with Jesus Christ. We'll be coming with him. But these are people who are left on the earth that made it through the tribulation who are the believers. They'll get to go into the kingdom. The unbelievers will not. Look at the next angel. This is the sixth angel. And another angel came out of, he out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he had a sharp Sickle. He's coming with a sickle. And then look, here's the next one. Verse 18, then another angel. This is the seventh angel. And look what this says. Another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar. There, there's two altars, y'all. There was an altar out front uh, called the brazen altar. And then there was an altar on the inside, which was prayers. This says come in with fire. This is a judgment. That's where judgment was. And notice what it said. The other angel had power over fire, came from the altar. And he called with a loud voice to one the sharp sickle, saying, Put in 
your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vines of the earth because the grapes are ripe. He's saying, right, we're ready to get them. We're ready to judge the world. If you remember what did Jesus say in Matthew, he's coming with his angels to judge. He's coming with his angels here. These are the angels doing this. And it's very, very powerful. And so this angel coming from the altar and he's coming and saying, it's time to judge. By the way, fire always has this idea of a judgment there. And they're ready. Now watch verse 19. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them in the great winepress of the wrath of God. And so he gathers them up. This is that, that's the wrath. By the way, so like I said a while ago, it's symbolic of a guy would go out, he'd cut down the vines, they got all the grapes on them, they would take them, they'd put them in the wine press, they would crush it down, and the grape juice would come out. It's symbolic of saying the angels are going to come, we're going to cut down the people, we're going to put them in the wine press, and that's going to be the end of them. Now this next verse, the next couple of verses, are going to be shocking. So I want you to look at it where, where, where it's hard to figure out exactly what's going on. So in verse 19 again, the angel swung his sickle to the earth, gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, threw them in the great winepress of the wrath of God. That's what John 3.36 says. But the wrath, wrath of God is coming to unbelievers. That's what's going to happen. And watch what this next verse says. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and the blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Now, I want you to understand something. Here's the city, Jerusalem. It's built on a hill called Mount Zion, Mount Moriah. And then as you go this direction, you're going up toward a big, a big plain called the Plain of, of, Z of Zerulun. And, and, and then there's a mountain up there called Megiddo. In Hebrew, mountain is Har. If you say Mount Megiddo in Hebrew, you say Armageddon. And we get Armageddon from it. Because in that valley, where that mountain is, there is going to be a war. And these armies are coming to Jerusalem. And this is what it's talking about. They're coming to Jerusalem and the wine press. And let me put this up here. Uh, there's going to be a crushing in the plain of Jezreel at the Mount of Megiddo. There's going to be the final war. Now, we talked about this two weeks ago. And we won't get it till another chapter. But at this time, the devil, the false prophet, and the Antichrist open their mouths. The Bible says they open their mouths and three frogs come out, one from each of their mouths. And these three frogs represent a prophecy or a command. And it is a command for all the armies of the world to come to attack Jerusalem. That's why they're all coming. That's why they're in the plain of Jezreel. That's why they're at the Mount of Megiddo, which is Har-Megeddon, Armageddon. That's why they're coming. It doesn't tell us here, but we'll see it in the next chapter or two. Now, here's what this verse says, and this is what is strange. It says, the blood was up to a horse's bridle for 200 miles. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that blood will be that deep for 200 miles? That's a lot of blood. What do you think? It's a lot of blood. Or does it mean that blood will be spattered that high for 200 miles? Or does it mean that bodies will be piled up that high for 200 miles? I know what it actually says. It says the blood was that high. When those nations of the world come to attack Israel and Jesus Christ comes and this judgment comes, there are going to be a whole bunch of unbelieving evil people that are going to be put to death. And the, I, it, it says, for a distance of 200 miles, I, I don't know. Now, let me ask you something. Have you ever seen anything like this before? Well, look at this. Isaiah 63. There's a person asking a question to, the, to God. They're saying, why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads the wine press? And then he answers, this is God. I have tried in the wine press alone. And from the peoples, there was no one with me. I also tried them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. And then their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments and I stained all my clothes. I trampled down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk with my wrath. And I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. That's Isaiah. And many believe that this is Isaiah giving the prophecy of this passage right here. When he comes to trample down the, the unbelieving world. The separation of the sheep from the goats. 
Wow. So what have we seen? We have seen seven seal judgments. We've seen seven trumpet judgments. We have not seen the tra tra seven bowl judgments yet. That's going to start in the next chapter. We're going to see it in just a few minutes. But all of this happens and then the return of Christ. Now, let me remind you again. Uh, and I, I think I have. Yeah, I do have this. Uh, that the seven seal judgments covered the entire tribulation. When we read that in chapter 6, it covered the entire tribulation. And at the end, Jesus came. When we saw the seven trumpet judgments, it covered what we understand to be the last part of the, three, the, of the seven years, the last three and a half years. And when it ended, Jesus came. And we're going to look now at the seven bowl judgments, and we're going to see that when the seven bowl judgments are over, Jesus comes. This is what we see. God is telling us all kind of things that are going to happen, and then Jesus comes. The most important event in the tribulation Jesus coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're going to see it perfectly in Revelation 19, beginning at verse 11. We will see that. So let's see what happens in verse 15. Look what he said, uh, chapter 15. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, these are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So he's seeing that here they come. He would already saw a woman clothed, the sun and the moon, the red dragon. Now he's seen seven angels with seven plagues. This is the end. This takes place. This is really basically when the sickle and everything is happening at the same time. Notice, and I, look, I saw something, verse 2. I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps. He looks and he sees these victorious believers. They're standing there and it looks like glass, but it looks like fire. And they got harps in their hands and they're singing. And he said they were victorious over the beast, his image, which is that idol, and the number. How are they victorious? Well, because they are the blood of the Lamb. How, how is any of us victorious? Because we have believed in Jesus Christ, faith in Christ who died and rose again, who gives us eternal life, and we're saved and saved forever. And these people are those who were living in the tribulation and believed in Christ, and they, even though they're dead, they got killed, they, they have great victory. So look what they're doing. They're singing. And, and notice it says in verse 3, they sang the song of Moses and the bondservant the bond of God and the song of the Lamb. They're singing two songs. One song is called the Song of Moses. That's found in Exodus 15. One is called the Song of the Lamb. That's found in Revelation chapter 5. What was the Song of Moses? When the nation of Israel came out of Egypt and Moses led them and the Red Sea parted and they went all the way through and they got to the other side, Egypt went in there and the water covered over them when it drowned all the Egyptians. They sang the Song of Moses, which is God has saved us and redeemed us. They're singing that same song. And then, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, is actually the song of the Lamb. And listen to this. This is it. They sang the song. Worthy are you to take the book and to break the seals, for you were slain. You purchased for God every person from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You made them to be the priest, and they will reign. So they're singing these two songs. While all of this is about to happen, they're singing two songs. And I want you to see the song for just a second. Uh, it says, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways. Bless the nations. He says, God is great. Listen, when you sing these songs on Sunday morning, what do we mean by that? We're saying, you are the Lamb of God. You're the Savior. You're the God. You're our Savior. You're our King. You're everything. He is great. He's the Almighty. He is righteous and true. And, and he says, who, in verse 4, who will not fear the name of the Lord? Now, let me ask you something. I have people come up to me, and they'll say, well, what does it mean to fear God? And, and a lot of people say, does that mean like we're supposed to be afraid all the time, that, that if we mess up, he gets us? No, the fear of God doesn't mean that. In fact, Swindoll says this, fear does not mean fright. The right kind of fear is reverence for his holy name, a wholesome respect for his sovereign will. Realize that God means what he says. When we say we fear the Lord, that means we recognize that he is the all-powerful, eternal God who loves us with an everlasting, unchanging love, and yet he is God, and he does what he says, and he means what he says. And so that's the idea of the fear of the Lord. And so they have that. And, and so he goes on to say that you're holy. And let me just tell you, holy means set apart. God is not part of the creation. Do you understand that? God is not part of the creation. I've had people come up to me and say, you know, God's the air that I breathe. No, he's not. He created the air you breathe, but he's not the air. That's pantheism. 
Pantheism is God is in everything. He's in that chair. He's in his wood. That's pantheism. No. We believe that Jesus Christ is separate from his creation. And also, he's holy because he's sinless and perfect and righteous. It says, all the nations will come before him. That's true. Isaiah 66, 23 says it. Also, they're quoting Psalm 86, verse 9. Now, quickly, we'll get to the end. What's going to happen? After these things, after he saw these people singing, I looked at the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. Do you understand what that is? He saw the temple and the testimony. The testimony is the Ark of the Covenant. There's an Ark of the Covenant in heaven, just like the one that was made on the earth. The one that was made on the earth was made after the one in heaven. He looks and sees it, and he goes, oh my gracious, I see the Ark in the heaven, and it was opened, and then look what happened. And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple clothed in linen and bright and clean and bright and girded around their chest with golden sashes. Here they come. They're coming to bring this judgment. The seven angels with the seven plagues. And then watch the next verse. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of what? The wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Do you remember what we saw back early? When we, and if you hadn't been here, I'm, you, know, you just maybe missed it or something. But back early, he described what he saw in heaven. And there's a throne. And the God the Father is sitting on the throne. But you can't tell what he looks like. And then there is Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb by the throne. And then there's the seven spirits of God, which is the Holy Spirit, around the throne. Then there are 24 elders around the throne, which represent the church and the nation of Israel. Then there are these four living creatures that have all these wings and faces and eyes, and they're flying around. And then there's just millions and millions of angels around the throne. One of these four living creatures comes to the seven angels and gives them the seven bowls that they're going to pour out the wrath on the earth. And then it says, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels was finished. It's filled with the glory of God. One of the angels gives it to him, uh, and then the temple was filled with the glory of God. So I want you to see something. I want you to think about it. We're about to see this. This We just saw the, we've seen the trumpet judgments. We've seen the, 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 the seal judgments. We've seen those seven angels do judgments. And now we're going to see these last seven angels give the final judgments. When all this comes to pass, Jesus Christ is coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to rule on this earth. Now, we'll, all be, we'll already be up there with him, and when he comes back, we're coming back. But he's coming back with his angels to do the judging. So we've seen the end, at the end of the seven seals, at the end of the seven trumpets, at the end of the seven bowls, Jesus comes as the king. What a passage. You know, we, we have to be ready to share our faith. So let me give you two quick applications. One is, let's just realize that God is faithful. He is. He's faithful to do everything. He's faithful to save. He is faithful to send his son. Jesus Christ came down on the cross, paid for sin, has opened it up and said, anyone who will ever believe in me will, will never perish but have eternal life. And we can go anywhere in the world and we can proclaim that message to any human being. And anyone who will believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life will be saved and saved forever. He is faithful to save us and provide salvation. He is also faithful to judge. We're seeing it. He judges with the, with the vile judgments and the bold judgments and the seven angels angels and the sickles and everything else. And he's coming to judge the world in righteousness and justice. Psalm 2 said he will rule the world with a rod of iron. So we've got to be ready. And I, I talked about it in the first service and I talked about it at the beginning of this service. We have to be ready to tell people how they can have eternal life. If Jesus came any second, and he come, he can come any second. There's nothing left. Jesus could come right now and we'd all be disappeared. I hope, I hope there'd be nobody left in this room. If Jesus came right now, we're gone. And all those people who have not believed, they're left on this earth to go through what we're seeing in this book. In the time that we have, we have to be telling people how to have eternal life simply by faith alone and Christ alone. We've got to do that. We do not know how long we've got. He could come at any second and we'll be gone. So let's be ready to do that. The second thing is, let's just give glory to God. You know what those songs were? Those songs. 
the songs are righteousness. The song is he's the, the king. The, the song that everybody's going to come. The song that he's the redeemer. I love the songs we sang today. Every one of the songs we sang today matched this passage. One of the songs was the song of the lamb. That was they sang. One of the songs was great is the faithfulness. And that's what we see. God is faithful to judge and faithful to save. Great stuff. <laughs>